Climate change is faster and more severe in the Arctic than most of the world. And it's getting warmer there each year. Part of adapting is taking what nature gives you, and that is exactly what residents are doing. Dog sledding is being phased out because it's more practical to take a snowmobile. But dog sledding still remains an important activity and an honored tradition. CCTV Sean Caleb's traveled to a remote part of Canada for our continuing series on thin ice. This is what passes for an early spring day in the Arctic in the northern Canadian town of Inuvik. Frigid temperatures and blowing snow. And many residents have turned out for the annual spring festival dog sled race. Is he happy? Are you happy, big boy? You're going to run and lead, you big pole, okay? Dan Heilbrunn is considered among the favorites. The lead dogs are the most driven of the bunch that respond to me the best and that fool around the least and that are typically the fastest. These dogs aren't your stereotypical huskies. Heilbrunn says his team is built for speed, important considering this race is a sprint. Today is 16 kilometers and it's uh, all out as fast as you can the whole way around the track. It's just as fast as you possibly can. Yeah, there's no, not much pacing. Inuvik is developing tourism as a way to bolster the community's bottom line. And the Arctic Chalet Company is tapping into that market, offering dog sled rides. Okay, so your leaders are Alta Fjord, <laughs> Alta, uh, Kabluna, Kamek, Gambut, Yuki, and Chinook. We got there late on a perfect day, booking the last two teams. And what the White Huskies lack in experience, they make up in spirit. <laughs> That's Yuki and Chinook causing all that trouble back there. Yeah, they talk a, lot. a quick tutorial, and off we go. You're looking at the traditional method of transportation in the far north, sled dog teams. Nowadays, they've largely been replaced by snowmobiles, or skidoos, as they're called up here. However, sled dog teams are still used by hunters and trappers who venture far into the bush. It's pretty intuitive to drive the team. There aren't many rules, but one is critically important. If for any reason you fall off your sled, hold on and become the human anchor. A lesson that CCTV photographer Andrew Smith found out the hard way. Okay, here's what he did wrong. You don't take your eye off the trail or the dogs. But he makes a good human anchor. But this looks a lot worse than it really was. And he didn't break the golden rule. He hung on. Go on. Go on. A negative 21, a good headwind with the dogs running full speed. Very cold for us, but to the locals, this is nothing. This is, this is the start of great weather. And nothing for Dan Heilbrunn as his team cruises to a second place finish in the big race. And on a trail like this, you just feel like you're on a magic carpet or something. You're just flying. And one time honored tradition that many in the region continue to embrace as practical as it is entertaining. From top of the world to top of the agenda, Sean, you spent months there in the Arctic, and as we speak, the Paris Climate Change Summit is taking place. How can negotiators in Paris help the people of the Arctic, and what would the people of nor the North tell them? It's interesting because the people of the North are arguably being affected greater by climate change than any other place on Earth. It is warming up twice as fast as any other place on Earth. So what the people of the North would say is we are not the ones that are spewing stuff into the atmosphere, uh, greenhouse gases, but we are being affected greatly. It's changing the way of life, and what's going on here is going to one day affect you the same way. Your coastal areas will be more and more threatened. That's the message they would get on. That's certainly something that a majority of the nations we've heard from uh, the United States and China came to an agreement before they went there. So really, it, it's kind of hard to believe you look at that, but just a slight uptick in temperature is making a huge difference there. And that is what the negotiators in Paris need to do. They need to come to some kind of agreement to limit greenhouse gases, to control that temperature so it doesn't uh, go above two degrees centigrade in the next uh, uh, generation. 
Is the Arctic on the minds of the international community, do you think? Without, without question. I mean, there are only eight nations that have land in the Arctic, but this is such a global phenomenon because what's going on there? Ice is melting in that area, so many countries are now going through there. They're going to be trying to extract or exploit res uh, uh, resources in the area, but there are a number of nations, the United States, uh, China, the Nordic nations, Russia, so many have research stations going on because they're trying to find out what is happening, how they can uh, key into this to see how the greenhouse gases are affecting the rest of the world and warming conditions up. And if they can get some handle on that, it, it, it's, it's weird because you look at how wide it is out there where we are. That's by Than, one of her photographers lying on his back. But uh, black soot comes out of the sky, lands on the snow and ice, and instead of the snow and ice reflecting the sun's energy and heat, it is absorbing it. So it's warming up and it's like a vicious cycle. And we've seen in your documentary and through all your various reports that the people there are really struggling with keeping their culture, keeping the traditions they've had for hundreds of thousands of years and, and this development that you've been talking about as well, this energy development. Very much so. So how, how are they navigating this? Most of the people we talk to are really trying to keep one foot in the past, really anchored to the traditions that they hold very dear, the stories, the dances, the music, the way they live their life through subsistence hunting and moving forward. They want to have a better future for their children. They want better education. They want services. They want roads to come into that area. If indeed the way things are uh, shaping up, more industry comes into that area, they want to have control over it. So they're talking to these various companies, the offshore and onshore oil companies, the mineral giants, the various nations that come through with ships, even cruise ships off the coast about 100 kilometers north of uh, the town where we are in uh, Canada right there are, go are going through there. They want to work more with these companies so they, in their words, have a seat at the table. But they really do hold the traditions very dear. Uh, but there you see the ice floating off the coast. That is the big concern. The coastal ice that is so important to that region is going away. It's affecting the people. It's affecting the animals. And that's key.